Okay, so let's actually talk about the cocktail party effect. Imagine pre-COVID, you're at a party, there's lots of conversations going on. Maybe you're trying your first, I don't know, apple martini, um, and you're just having a good time and you're talking with people. Now, the fact that you can pay attention to one conversation and ignore everything else, that's interesting, right? You're able to filter out and ignore everything else and just pay attention to the one conversation that you're having. Those of you who are bilingual know that if you're a little weak in one language, you really have to pay attention in a party to be able to filter everything out. But you're doing that, the party's going along, no problem. And all of a sudden, you hear Professor Maggie Schiffrar. You hear your name. What happens? Whoop! So much for my apple martini, right? I immediately <laughs> redirect my attention to wherever it is my name was said. Now, here's the question. If I'm filtering out all the ignored information, how did I ever hear my name? So that's a great question, and cognitive psychologists have been asking themselves this exact question for a very long time. So we're gonna talk about three attempts to answer that question. Um, there is a, a group of theories called early selection theories. That The idea is that the filter, the stuff that you're not paying attention to gets filtered out very early. That's one set of theories. And that the major proponent there is a fellow by the name of Donald Broadbent. Then there's a second level of theories called the intermediate selection theories. And the idea is, well, there's a little bit of processing and then you filter out the unattended information. Um, that's associated with Ann Treisman. And then there's the late in processing theories um, by McKay. And the idea there is actually you do quite a bit of processing and then you get rid of the unattended information. So let's look at each of those uh, theories in turn. Okay, so the first one is early selection theories. And Donald Brontbed, um, super famous cognitive psychologist, is known for proposing these theories. And these theories suggest that once you decide what you're gonna pay attention to, you continue to pay attention to that thing based on its physical characteristics. So, for example, if you're at a party and somebody's talking really loud, then it's the loudness that you use to determine what you're going to pay attention to. Everything else is lost. Person who's speaking very loudly, right, the physical characteristic there, the loudness, um, sorry for yelling, mm -hmm. um, that person could start talking about different stories. I could speak loudly and start talking about, I don't know, my childhood and then switch to our previous exam and something else. But as long as I kept the same physical characteristics, you would be able to follow and pay attention to um, what I was saying. That's an early selection theory. Again, what you pay attention to and what you filter, at, filter out is based on the physical characteristics of the signal how loud it is, where it's coming from, that sort of thing. And according to Broadbent, only the information um, uh, that gets passed through the attentional filter is processed further. So we haven't really talked about sensory memory yet, but sensory memory is a very, very low level kind of memory that's associated with each sensory system. So my visual system can hang on to information for just like, really briefly, quarter of a second, half of a second, my auditory system, maybe two seconds. Um, that kind of really brief sensory memory, that's what Broadbent's talking about. Um, so it's briefly held information is selected based on its physical characteristics and everything else is lost. Only the stuff that's attended to only the stuff you're paying attention to is actually processed in any deep cognitive way. Broadbent's theory is also known as the bottleneck theory of attention. And I've drawn a picture of a bottle here for you to get the idea of the analogy. The idea is you can have a lot in a bottle. You can have a lot of incoming sensory information, but only a small amount of it is going to get passed through to be processed more deeply. So for example, only a small amount of it is going to reach your conscious awareness. 
So the key aspects of Broadbent's theory are that attention is super limited and that the vast majority of the information that comes into your sensory systems is filtered out and lost. Okay, you can say that Broadbent's model is a really good starting place, and, it's, and it is, but it has trouble dealing with attention based on meaning. So for example, let's go back to the cocktail party effect. I can be at a party and really pay att paying attention to a conversation with a particular person. Someone else on the other side of the room can say my name. Whoop! I pay attention to, I, all my attention gets focused over there. They didn't have to yell my name. Okay. So that's a problem for Broadbent's theory. A related problem is, is a type of studies called the Dear Aunt Jane studies. And the Dear Aunt Jane studies are, again, dichotic listening experiments where you have a different message coming into each ear. But the change in the Dear Aunt Jane experiments is that it's not that there's one coherent message going to my left ear and another coherent image going into my right ear. That's not what's happening. In the Dear Aunt Jane experiments, what's happening is the coherent message is starting in one ear and then going to the other ear and then going back and forth, right? So I might hear one message about Abraham Lincoln and another message about, I don't know, the Bobcat forest fires. And the message is switching ears all the time. What the experimenter tells subjects to do in this case is to just pay attention to one ear. So if a, if a subject could do that, they would start out hearing a word or two about Abraham Lincoln, then they'd hear about the Bobcat fire, then they'd be back to Abraham Lincoln, then they'd be back to the Bobcat fire. They just did what the experimenter told them to do. But that's not the result of the Dear Aunt Jane experiments. What happens is you tell people to attend to one ear, they can't do it. Our attentional systems naturally follow meaning. So without the, ex the subjects being aware of it at all, they are shifting their attention from one ear to the next ear and back to the other ear and back to this ear because attention follows meaning. That's the, the take home message from the Dear Aunt Jane experiments is that what we pay attention to is determined a lot, not by just the physical characteristics of the information, but by the meaning of the information. Okay. What comes in? Anne Treisman, who actually was a graduate student from Donald Broadbent. And she argued that, you know what, it's just not the case that everything from the unattended ear or the unattended eye or the unattended hand is lost. So Anne Treisman came along and she modified Broadbent's theory. And the way she did it was by saying, it's not all or nothing that either you pay attention to a message and you process it, or you ignore a message and it's lost. It's a matter of degree. In other words, it's not black and white, it's gray. And the way she put in the grayness was by something called, an, she called an attenuator. And the attenuator is just something that analyzes the message in terms of the meaning that picks out the meaningful information. So um, for Treisman, this attenuator is the filter. It's a meaning-based process. And attended information gets through the filter and is processed. Unattended information gets through the filter too. It's just quieter. So it has to be really important before it catches anybody's attention. So Treisman argued that even unattended information gets in, gets processed by later cognitive systems a little bit. And how much information is processed or how extensively information is processed at subsequent cognitive levels depends on the meaning of the information. So Broadbent was, Broadbent was all about physical characteristics, of the message determining what you did and didn't pay attention to or how the filtering happened. 
Treisman was all about the meaning of the message in shaping what does or doesn't get attended to. That leaves us with the third stage, late selection theories of attention. And in late selection theories of attention, honestly, it's kind of a, a more extreme version of uh, Treisman's theories, but I'm a little biased because I think Anne Treisman walks on water or walked on water. Um, but the idea behind the late selection theory of attention is captured by the following study. So imagine that you're hearing a message in one ear and in the other ear, you're hearing a word. So for example, the word bank. A bank could be a physical building that you put money in or the bank, a bank could be a side of a river, a river bank, right? It's ambiguous. So um, what folks who tested the late selection theory of attention looked at is they had people listen to ambiguous statements, such as they threw stones at the bank. Well, you could throw rocks at a physical building or you could throw rocks at the side of a river, right? It works either way. What happened is they'd have you pay attention to the ear where the story's coming in about throwing rocks at the river. In this ear, I'm paying attention to the statement, they threw stones at the bank. This is the ear I'm paying attention to. The ear that I'm ignoring the message in, I'm either hearing money or river. Money implies one kind of bank, river implies a different kind of bank. Um, and when they asked people what the attended message was, it turns out that how people interpreted the intended message depended completely on the word that was said in the unattended ear. How do, what, what's the meaning of that? Well, it tells us that information is selected or filtered out after the meaning has been completely determined, right? So it's even more meaning-based than Anne Treisman's theory. That's what I'm going to tell you about uh, selective attention. Come right back and we'll talk about attention as a limited resource.